Uh, my name is Wesley, this is Wu Ken Cook. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, we're here every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 6.30 PST, uh, with new recipes out every Friday. Uh, today we're doing a Thai noodle dish called Thai Drunken Noodles, at least that's how it's like colloquially known here in the States. Uh, the actual name of it is called Pad Kimau, which is closely associated to another very, very popular dish called Pad Siu. Uh, I would say here in the States, at least, if you're talking about like Thai takeout, uh, probably the top three dishes that you would see in Thai takeout is Pad, Sima, uh, pad Kimau, Pad Siu, and then Pad Thai, probably the big three. Uh, today we're doing though we're doing pad came out. Uh, we're going to be we're using a couple of different things to kind of like dive into uh, the various different ways that you can see this noodle dish done. So uh, today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be instead of using the more traditional, more commonly found uh, use of chicken thigh, we're actually going to be using instead today uh, some ground pork, which is actually pretty traditional and relatively common in a lot of different versions of pad Um uh, In addition to that, though, other otherwise though. Uh, it's pretty similar to how you would generally see a pad, king, uh, pad CU done uh, because it has a very, very similar sauce base, very, very similar treatment of the noodles, uh, and just generally a very similar dish other, other than the uh, like elements of protein that you'll see. So um, the more that I have dove into how to do this dish, uh, the more that I discovered they're very, very similar and almost borderline the same dish uh, other than a couple of very, very... Um, small details that you sort of change. Uh, so if you have any questions for me, feel free and drop your questions in the chat. I don't know everything about Thai noodles, but I know lots of stuff. I'm getting pretty good at working with Chow Fun today, so uh, feel free and drop those questions in the chat. Uh, if you're looking for the recipes, those always live over on my YouTube channel, so if you haven't checked out the YouTube channel yet, uh, that's always a fun place that I recommend checking out. Um, 
uh, everything that I cook on stream, almost everything I cook on stream, I wouldn't say everything, but I'd say like 95% of the things that I'm cooking on stream, uh, they will generally have a recipe video that goes along with it. Uh, and in those recipe videos, we tend to move a little bit slower and kind of like talk through some of the decision making that goes behind uh, why I do certain things in recipes and why I leave certain things out and like uh, what sort of like makes these recipes tick and like that sort of, in my, in my experience, at least the, the, as far as how I've learned how to cook, uh, is sort of like been a big part of how I've sort of uh, learned how to not just like follow a recipe, but like how to go beyond following a recipe and like explore like uh, more than what just like makes a recipe like assembled together, but like how to like really understand what's actually happening when you when you cook these things. Uh, so if you're interested in stuff like that, I definitely recommend uh, hopping over to the YouTube channel to check out some of that stuff. Lots of fun content uh, popping up over there. Oh, Hermina, oh, how's it going? Tough weather, oh yeah, really. Uh, I don't know where you are, but here in California though, it's actually pretty decent. Uh, it's like 75 and sunny out here. Alex does music, oh cool. Uh, advice for your 25 year olds. <laughs> oh man. I have so much advice for my 25 year olds now. <laughs> um, what would I say? I have so many different things that I could tell you. Uh, I'm assuming Alex does music, I'm assuming you're a musician. So, uh, for lots of folks who have like tuned into this stream, uh, you might also know that the, my actual career by profession and like training, and I went to school for it, and I have like a legitimate like 15 year background in playing music for a living. Um, uh, but what, what I would tell that 25 year old version of myself, which is almost 10 years ago now, uh, is to uh, just not be afraid to mess up. Do stuff. Uh, don't be, be afraid to be bad at stuff. Don't be afraid to just do, do terribly at everything. Uh, because that's how you learn stuff. So uh, that's certainly how I learned how to cook. That's also how I learned how to play music. That's how I learned to play most of the instruments that I know how to play. So that's definitely how I learned how to sing. That's how I learned how to play guitar. Uh, it's the reason why I'm learning how to speak Mandarin right now. All of those things. Uh, just don't be afraid to be bad at it. Um, but yeah, I have, I have so many. So many things that I wish I could tell my 25-year-old self not to do. Nourish your mic, how's it going? Yeah. But what are we cooking tonight? Yeah, today we're doing a Thai noodle dish. It's called Pad Siu, or a colloquially, here in the States it's colloquially, uh, not Pad Siu, Pad Ki Mao. But here in the States it's more colloquially known or referred to as Thai drunken noodles. Uh, I don't know where that name comes from. I'm pretty sure it's just a thing that Americans made up. Um, they don't really, the Thai, thai drunk noodles does not really involve any alcohol at all, so I, that kind of eliminates the possibility of maybe that's why uh, people are calling it, that Americans call it Thai drunken noodles. I honestly, I just think it's just some random thing that Americans made up. Uh, the in Thai, in like traditional Thai cuisine, uh, you would more commonly, or more commonly see it referred to as Pad, uh, pad Ki Mao. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, if you've never had oh, you've never had uh, any Thai noodle dishes with ground pork. Yeah, um, I uh, have had a number of pad pad kima. I think I've only ever had pad kima with with ground pork. Uh, today, actually, what we're going to be using is ground turkey, uh, mostly because I have a lot of ground turkey and I need to use it up. Um, but definitely, like the more traditional thing to use would be ground pork. Um, but yeah, for sure. Uh, well, these are probably too thick. Uh, yeah, but for sure, for sure, like probably the one of the only Thai noodle dishes that I've come across that has ground pork in it uh, is pad ki mao, uh, and I like I found that it like you can use it relatively interchangeably, uh, and it will still like it results in a very very different dish. Uh, but depending on like you f who you find that's cooking it, you'll find that like uh, they can look dramatically different, and like the use of protein can like change very very dramatically, uh, which I always thought is super interesting. So. So today we're going to be using, uh, we're actually going to be using this ground pork, uh, ground turkey. Uh, but the original recipe that I had written uses ground pork. Um, and uh, uh, the main, re the real main reason why I used ground pork uh, is because I also did another recipe that's called uh, for a pad cu, which is very, very similar to a pad ki mao. Uh, and I was just generally like kind of looking for ways to do it differently uh, because uh, the pad cu, I mean, other like if we didn't change it very dr dramatically, otherwise it would look very, very similar um, because they're they're almost exactly the same dish uh, with a, like a handful of changes. Um, yeah. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. 
so yeah, uh, I would say like the biggest difference between the Pad CU and the Pad Kimo, it's actually not that so much about the use of meats. Uh, but what I think like the more, the more research that I've done about this, the more that I've found is that the biggest thing that changes in between those two dishes uh, is that a Pad Kimo traditionally has a, a few more vegetable elements that go on. Uh, so in a Pad CU, you would generally only find um, probably gailan would be the only thing that you really come across. In, the, my, in my version for Pad Kimo, uh, I had actually done, uh, instead of gailan, I used regular old broccoli, which is what we're using today too. Um, and that would, in, as far as like, a pad CU, that would probably be pretty much the only thing that you'll come across, the only veggies that you'll come across in a pad CU. Um, whereas in a pad kimao, like what we're doing today, uh, you generally will come across a couple other extra veggies. So today what we're going to be using uh, is some red bell pepper and half of a sweet white onion. And I think uh, that's going to be like a relatively common addition uh, to the vegetables that you've come across uh, in a lot of pad kimaos. You've been trying to reach me about your extended burn. Yeah, interesting. Uh, cool, so what's real tricky about um, the use of veggies in a lot of pad kimaos, or at least in my experience, like how after I've done this dish a number of times, uh, is that you kind of have to exercise a lot of restraint not to throw too many vegetables in it because, or like too much of any one vegetable in it because we're actually going to be adding uh, quite a number of veggies today. So uh, as far as our broccoli go goes, I'm actually going only going to add this is a single small head of broccoli, uh, which is not really actually that much of broccoli. Maybe I'll add like one more small head of broccoli. Uh, but we're actually not going to add that much to it. Uh, where I, whereas, like in a, like in a pad CU, I would probably throw in like two or three whole heads of broccoli, uh, and that's because we're adding so many different vegetables that if we use too much of it, it will probably become overwhelming. <laughs> I can show the no cleavage. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, Texas just had a tornado warning. Wow, Carmina, that's crazy. I hope you're okay. Uh, yeah, I hope everyone in Texas is okay. Uh, like here, it's bright and sunny here in California, so that's crazy. Cool. All right, so what I'm doing right now is I'm chopping up my broccoli, but very specifically, I'm chopping my broccoli in a particular shape. Uh, and that's because instead, what you would more traditionally come across in a pad came out, or a pad CU really, uh, is the use of gailan, which is gonna look a little bit differently. You might colloquially see the use of gailan uh, referred to as Chinese broccoli, uh, which does not have that many parallels to broccoli. Uh, what's mostly uh, unique about it is that it's kind of a little bit longer. I guess it does have florets on the top too, uh, but it tastes dramatically different. But what's really important about it is that general shape. So the reason that gailan works in a wok fry for something like a pad kimao uh, is that it's so long and thin. So if we tried to do the same thing with a whole head of broccoli, like if I just chopped off a clove or a whole floret of broccoli and threw it into the wok, uh, it probably would not cook through all the way. And that's because uh, broccoli is like very, very tough. And it's the same reason why uh, generally when you use broccoli in wok fries, you would not see it thrown in straight. Uh, you would generally see it done with a par cook first. So uh, since we're not going to be par cooking our broccoli today, uh, what we're trying to do is slice it relatively thin, something like this. Um, relatively thin, long spears of broccoli. Uh, and that's going to help make sure that our broccoli cooks all the way through. So, uh, without that really, really small uh, shape, it will probably undercook. Um, and that is for the same reason why any t generally any time that you come across broccoli, at least in like most like Eurocentric recipes that I see the use of broccoli, uh, you would generally see it um, par cooked. So you probably see it very often. You might see uh, broccoli done with like a steam. It will probably be like steamed broccoli. Uh, sometimes you'll see it like blanched, so boiled and then ice bathed. Uh, sometimes you'll see it like baked. It will be like baked uh, for a really long time, probably 30, 35 minutes, and then broiled under the broiler uh, to get a really nice sear. Something, uh, whatever it might be, uh, most commonly when you see broccoli, used in a recipe in like a Eurocentric recipe, it probably will involve some kind of par cook to make sure that it's cooked all the way through. So uh, since we're not doing that today, we have to make sure uh, that we chop our broccoli very specifically so that it doesn't undercook. Otherwise you'll have raw broccoli. It's not good. So 
So that's our broccoli. Uh, I'm giving this a good shake. Uh, and then what we're trying to do, mostly when, when I'm giving this a shake, what I'm trying to do is get rid of all of the water. We don't want uh, any water left behind with our broccoli uh, once we give it a strain. Uh, anything that's left behind in that broccoli with as far as like liquid goes, uh, it's just going to contribute to uh, the difficulty with which we will have keeping our wok hot. So uh, the more that more liquid that ends up in your wok, uh, the more trouble you're going to have uh, keeping things hot. So uh, and that is going to be like the number one concern of anything that you're wok frying uh, is making sure that that wok stays hot. Yeah, she. The only part, part for course is the season change of summer. Yeah, totally. Uh, I have to. I will have to say that as someone who has lived in California their entire life, I have no re point of reference for what tornadoes are like. I have not even come close. Probably the closest thing that I have ever experienced is uh, the Wizard of Oz. That's probably it. <laughs> so I have no idea what that's like. But I hope. I hope that you're staying safe. That's really scary. Yeah, you don't get thunder. Yeah, you don't get much of that in California for sure. So uh, next up are our uh, onions here. So this is half of a sweet white onion. Uh, and then what we're gonna do, so this is like a thing that I have seen a lot of people debate about. Uh, most recently I've seen Kenji, Kenji Lopez talking about like how the proper way of chopping an onion. Uh, so what's really difficult, I guess like, most problematic about an onion is that it's circular, uh, which means that if we were to just chop straight down, uh, we would have very, very small bits on the sides and then very, very large bits on the center because it's conical. So it uh, has this circular shape. So uh, there is a specific degree that I know that Kenji Lopez had worked out. I forget what the degree is now. I watched it in a YouTube video that he did a while ago. Um, but I think it's something like 30 degrees or something like that. Uh, but the general gist of it is that we're going to cut our onion at an angle. So like so. Uh, and if you do it properly, hypothetically what you should end up with are relatively evenly sized pieces of onion. So we want, uh, here's an end piece and here's a larger uh, center piece. So generally going to be relatively close. That's pretty close. Yeah, that's like pretty close. Uh, and that's generally our goal for onions, uh, is to make sure that they're close. I guess you could even say that that's generally going to be the case for pretty much anything that we're chopping, uh, is to make sure that they're relatively close in the shape and size as each other. Um, and that's just going to make sure uh, that they cook evenly. Oops. So let's try not to drop them. The onion saver shaped like an onion, yeah. If you don't have an onion saver, I guess I could show these. Up. These are my favorite things. Uh, this is an onion saver. Uh, it's literally, I guess, like a piece of tupperware that's shaped like an onion. Uh, but it's it looks kind of kitsch and like silly, uh, but it's super useful because uh, otherwise I would use a Ziploc bag for every onion that I ever cut, uh, which is incredibly wasteful. Uh, and I would probably burn through like 10, 12 Ziploc bags a week, uh, which I used to do before I got my onion savers, so I love them. Uh, Nate, oh yeah, new microphone, yes, I do, yeah. I guess we should be showing this off. So we crowdfunded this over on YouTube, so uh, for some folks are already watching on YouTube, they already know about this, but over on YouTube, there's a there's a link uh, that we're taking donations for, and it's almost always, anytime that I take a donation, it's not really for anything other than to just update the gear. Um, so there's a number of problems with the gear that happen on, on the YouTube and the Reddit streams. Uh, one of the main, like, buggy problems that has been happening is that the, the Reddit mic keeps crashing, uh, and like, it, that's why uh, if you've ever watched one of these streams and you'll notice that like uh, sometimes the microphone sounds like it's underwater or it just sounds like it's not plugged in properly uh, that's because I have a piece of crap mic that I used to have a really shitty microphone that goes through Reddit uh, that's from like the 80s <laughs> uh, so we crowdfunded some money uh, and uh, folks everyone chipped in and then we got this new microphone which is this uh, nice Rhodes Go mic that's plugged into my guitar. Yeah, I love it. It sounds good. Yeah, it does. I love this mic. Um, I also figured out how... Uh, 
like a, this gets really techy, but I, what I, I also figured out how to divide the CPU processing between Re uh, Reddit and OBS. Uh, so I think I figured out a way that I can start using the uh, onboard compression. Uh, so that's part of what makes this mic sound so good too, is that uh, uh, we have a compressor running through. Um, cool. They call that a knife, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love this knife. Uh, lots of people ask about this knife. Um, it's a French chef's knife, uh, and I got it at an estate sale for 10 bucks. It's like a $200 knife. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so next up, what I'm doing, these are some Thai chilies. So, uh, in my opinion, I would say that this might be one of the most important in ingredients to almost any Thai dish, definitely for something like a Pad Siu, uh, because it's like, or Pad Kimau, excuse me, uh, because it is one of those like really, really quintessential Thai flavors. So without it, uh, you could you probably come close to getting a dish that looks like a, a traditional Pad Kimau, uh, but you're not really gonna nail down that flavor without the use of uh, thai, uh, thai chilies, um, because it's kind of got that like really unique spice uh, that comes from the capsaicin that is specifically associated with Thai chilies. So, um, with a lot of the Thai noodle dishes that I use, or that I make, I very explicitly have to use a Thai chili. Uh, you can totally substitute it if you can't find it. Uh, you can uh, find yourself using, I used to use like jalapenos, you could use a serrano, will probably come pretty close. Um, but definitely if you're trying to get that really, really traditional and like iconic Thai flavor, uh, the use of Thai chilies, uh, Thai chili and Thai basil, those are the two things that are going to uh, really make or break your recipe. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I will the uh, the one thing that I will say about Thai chili or the one other thing I will say about Thai chilies uh, is that they are very very spicy. So uh, you'll notice that I'm not taking out any of the seeds. So all of the seeds in my Thai chili are still here. So you can see them. They're on the cutting board. Uh, we're gonna save all of those because I love the the heat that you get from a Thai chili. I think it's like. Uh, I don't really see a point in using Thai chili if you're not going to keep those seeds in because that's where all the flavor comes from. Um, but if you are heat averse, I would say uh, either dial it back or leave it out entirely. Um, I, I'm using six and it's going to get us like a moderately spicy uh, Pad Kimau. Uh, but depending on how much heat you want in your recipe, dial it up or down. Yeah. Oh, the other thing I'll say is that as they get older, they get more spicy too, so be careful. Uh, I have used some like really old Thai chilies uh, before and they get super spicy, so be careful about that. Cool. Uh, these are just some lemon wedges. I'm chopping that up and then setting that aside. Uh, next up, this is going to be two eggs that we're whisking up. Uh, the eggs uh, are gonna come in super, super late. So if you've ever made like most Chinese wok fries, for example, so if you've ever made any kind of fried rices, uh, or really any any kind of Chinese wok fry that happens in a wok, a wok, you will often see those eggs added really, really early. So like they might be the second or third thing that goes into the wok. Uh, and that's because what we're generally trying to achieve when we do that, throw eggs into a uh, Chinese fried rice, for example, uh, is we're trying to create these big curds of egg. Uh, so uh, for our purposes today, and with, uh, this is actually true for a lot of Thai noodle dishes, uh, the goal is not actually to create egg curds. Our goal is actually to coat our noodles in eggs. So we're actually going to throw those eggs in really, really late. They're going to be the very, very last thing that we throw in. Uh, uh, and that's just going to create that nice like egg coating to your chow fun, um, which is probably the thing that you'll associate with uh, almost every uh, Thai noodle dish that you've ever had. Uh, it's going to be that egg coating. Yeah. It looks like a veggie friendly meal. Yeah, I've actually, I've definitely had a pad kimau that has been done with uh, tofu, uh, for sure. And I have for sure made pad, uh, pad thai at least uh, with tofu. Uh, so yeah, totally a super, super veggie friendly dish. Uh, so I know lots of people have been requesting a lot of like vegetable uh, or like vegetarian or vegan. Uh, vegan is really, really hard with a lot of Asian stuff. Actually, someone asked this earlier on the YouTube channel. Uh, vegan stuff is really tough with Chinese, like generally Asian stuff, but especially like Chinese and Thai dishes. Uh, and that's specifically because a lot of Chinese food and a, a lot of Thai food too, uh, uses things like oyster sauce and fish sauce, uh, both of which are derived from the fermentation of fish. So a 
lot of the umami qualities that you get from uh, from those cuisines that come from uh, like the fermentation of fish. Uh, which means that if you're trying to cre create something that's vegan, you probably can't do it without those two elements. Uh, so I think you could come close because there's a lot of like decent like um, mushroom-based substitutes. Um, uh, but vegetarian is actually pretty easy because like most of these dishes can be done either with tofu or you can just leave the meat out entirely. Uh, there's so many vegetables in the pad, pad kimao already that you could just leave those veggies out. Uh, you could just leave the meat out and it would be fine. Uh, so, I'm assembling my sauce here now, so this is going to be uh, four tablespoons of soy sauce, and this is actually, I don't know if you just saw me change the, the page on my recipe book, but what we're going off of here right now is literally the exact recipe from my pad CU. Uh, so what we're using, we're going to do our sauce and our marinade, and they're literally the exact same sauce and marinade that go into the pad CU. Uh, and that is because a pad CU and a pad kimao are very similar, they're basically the same dish except for the veggies uh, and a couple other meat elements. So. Uh, for our sauce, uh, this is actually going to start looking pretty similar to a number of dishes that we've done. Uh, so definitely pad CU, but it also looks pretty similar to how you would see a beef chow fun uh, dish done. So I think this is going to be almost exactly the same as our beef chow fun, uh, except because beef chow fun it comes from Chinese food. Uh, in that beef chow fun, we used uh, dobanjang instead of what we're going to be using today, which is sambal olek, which are the equivalents. Uh, dobanjang comes from Chinese food, sambal olek comes from uh, Thai food, uh, and then we're also also going to be using uh, some fish sauce today instead of some oyster sauce. Actually, we're going to be using both. So, um, so I, that's that's always super interesting to me when I see dishes that have uh, a lot of like cross-culture similarities, even though they come from different places. So that's uh, four tablespoons of regular soy sauce, two tablespoons of black or dark soy sauce, and this is two tablespoons of black vinegar, uh, followed by. Uh, this is two tablespoons of fish sauce. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but fish sauce is fermentation of fish, um, and is a really, really important element. Oh, this is actually four tablespoons. My bad. Uh, I would say one of the more important flavors in a lot of Thai food is fish sauce. Uh, next up, this is our sambal olek, which is a, uh, a fermented chili paste that comes from Thai cuisine. Uh, if you're keeping track, there is a pretty similar thing that happens in like uh, almost every cuisine. So in Chinese food, there is a similar sauce. It's called dobanjang. Uh, in Korean food, there's another similar sauce. It's called uh, gochujang. Uh, in, in Japanese food, uh, there's a similar sauce that's called miso paste. Uh, all of these things, they're very, very similar uh, in quality of umami, uh, but mostly different from in where they come from. Yeah, uh, and then rounding everything out, this is going to be uh, two tablespoons of oyster sauce. And just in general, our goal here is to just sort of create that really, really interesting dark color to our sauce here. Uh, and that's going to really create that iconic color to our uh, overall noodle dish. So we're adding things like black soy sauce, dark soy sauce, uh, black vinegar, uh, oyster sauce, all of these things that are really, really dark in shade and color uh, are what create that really like interesting, like very, very deep brown uh, caramel color of our sauce, or our final noodle dish. Last up, I probably should have done this earlier because we needed to marinate it, but I forgot. Uh, I'm gonna do our marinade on our meat here today. So again, just like our sauce, this is the, this marinade is coming straight out of uh, the book for our pad CU. Um, the main difference today is that instead of chicken thigh, which we used in our uh, pad CU recipe. Today we're going to be marinating. This is actually ground turkey, uh, but in the original recipe uh, we were using ground pork, which is going to be pretty traditional. 
So starting things off, that's four tablespoons of soy sauce. Uh, followed by two tablespoons of Shaoxing wine, which is like dry cooking sherry. Shaoxing wine actually comes from Chinese food, um, but uh, I don't have any dry cooking sherry and they're pretty much the same thing. Let's see. Uh, next up is a single star anise pod. Uh, you will often see me using star anise in a lot of marinades. Uh, especially ones where we're trying to emulate Thai flavors uh, because I often find uh, that star anise is like one of the big qualities that you get from things like star, uh, Thai, Thai basil. Uh, I also use it a lot in recipes that uh, call for Chinese five spice because it's one of those flavors that I associate with a lot of Chinese five spice. Uh, so unless if you want to use Chinese five spice but you want to leave out some of the flavors that come from Chinese five spice. Uh, so very often what I'm trying to do is leave out the cinnamon qualities that come from five spice. Uh, the use of star anise in a marinade, super useful. Uh, and last up, that's half a teaspoon each of white pepper and cornstarch. Uh, the white pepper, I, uh, the white pepper is something that I add to a lot of marinades. I just think that it really like penetrates meat really well. Uh, but the cornstarch is really, really important too, uh, because what it's going to do is it's going to coat our meat uh, in a very, very thin layer of cornstarch. And it's pretty subtle, but what it's going to do uh, is it's going to slow down the exterior cook time of our meat uh, just long enough so that the interior of our meat can finish cooking. So. Uh, if you've ever had wok fried meats, uh, and it has this quality about it where the interior of your meat is very, very tender, uh, but the exterior is nice and crisp, that's happening because it's got a coating of cornstarch uh, to keep it from overcooking. Uh, and if you've ever had things like eggs or even like some, a lot of meats uh, where it's like kind of chewy and tough, and not really cooked properly, uh, that's probably because it didn't have any cornstarch. So what, we're, what the, probably the chef was trying to do uh, was either like finish cooking the interior of the chicken because the exterior has already seared, uh, but the interior didn't finish cooking yet, so they overcooked it on the exterior uh, in order to get it to cook all the way through. Or uh, super often you'll come across meats that are undercooked on the interior and perfectly cooked on the exterior uh, because they did not include cornstarch. Yeah, uh, you could also leave it out too. Uh, I also know that it's a little bit hard to find. I am I very frequently have trouble finding star anise, uh, but I, I I think that it works really really well in marinades, and it's super subtle too. Uh, oh, oh, you have uh, you're trying to get a wok, but you have an electric stove. Oh, cool. Yeah, lots of people ask about that. Uh, is it doable with a glass top stove? Um, so I have not really tried, I tried once or twice on an electric range. I think it was on an induction top. Um, so I don't have any direct experience with this, but lots of people have asked about it. So I've like brainstormed a lot of interesting solutions. Uh, and Nate, the, be like, the best solution that I've thought of so far uh, is to get yourself a cast iron wok. So this makes sense to me in theory. Uh, and I have also cooked on a cast iron wok a lot. Uh, so I know like how a cast iron is going to behave. But um, as far as I understand, the main problem that happens when you cook on an induction top uh, and this is also true for coil top, or any kind of electric top range, uh, is that uh, the coils or like the electric top and especially the coils uh, have an auto shut off. So it will hit a certain temperature uh, and then the, the range is going to shut off because it's uh, got this uh, heat attenuator that's supposed to be controlling how hot the range gets. Uh, and what it does is it heats up to a certain point and then it turns off until it cools down to a certain point uh, and then uh, will turn back on once it hits another temperature. Um, so then that's all like controlled by like where on the, on the, the knob of your stove range is, is set. Um, so that's generally going to be okay for like most frying pans that you use uh, because uh, most of the frying pans that you will come across uh, have a very, very heavy bottom uh, to it. Uh, and what that heavy bottom is doing is it's keeping that, that frying pan nice and hot for uh, any duration of time where you remove the frying pan from the, the heat. So uh, you could take a frying pan or like a standard skillet off heat for uh, five, 10 seconds and it would pretty much stay the same temperature because of that heavy bottom. So. Um, the problem with electric top ranges with woks is that those woks don't have one of those heavy bottoms. Uh, so they're not you're not going to be able to retain heat. So a wok, if you take a wok off heat uh, for a full 10 seconds, it will pretty much lose all heat. You will be, within 10 seconds, it will be hot enough to touch. Um, 
So the solution to that is has always been for like traditional wok cooking uh, is that the gas burner or whatever it is that you're cooking on uh, has to be on high heat for the entire duration of time. You will never ever see wok chefs uh, turn the heat down unless they're like slow cooking something. Um, so the solution that I have always come across is that uh, well, if you have a cast iron wok and this is uh, something that I haven't tested but I have cooked on a cast iron a lot uh, is that uh, if you have a, yourself a good cast iron wok uh, that heat the heat re retention of your cast iron wok is going to uh, prevent the wok from changing temperatures uh, during the time when the uh, induction top turns off so uh, the only draw drawback to that is that uh, cast iron wok is going to weigh a absurd amount <laughs> so uh, I was thinking about this the other day because I was looking at one uh, in a, I think it was in a Walmart or something uh, and um, I actually used to own one too, and they probably weighs close to 25, 30 pounds, depending on how big the wok is. Uh, which means that you're not going to be able to do things like wok tossing, uh, or like anything that like uh, requires any real agility. So you pretty much have to do all of your uh, tossing with a, with a spatula. Um, but it would definitely solve the heat retention issues. Um, so that's then like I think my best solution to uh, uh, cooking wok cooking on an induction range or a uh, coil range, for sure. Oh yeah, you're, the cornstarch is gonna yeah, it's gonna change your game on stir fry dishes. Yeah, um, uh, pretty much any kind of protein. So if if you're wok frying eggs, throw it throw it in some eggs. Uh, if you're wok frying chicken, uh, throw it in your chicken marinade. Uh, if you're doing uh, something that requires a real thick sear, so like Mongolian beef, for example, uh, if you've ever caught one of the Mongolian beef streams, uh, just coat the whole thing in some cornstarch and then sear it, uh, and that's going to give you a really crispy exterior. So you'll find that, like, in, especially in Chinese cooking, uh, cornstarch is like the big ingredient that a lot of people don't realize is in it. Uh, is either cornstarch or sometimes potato starch, tapioca starch, any kind of starch, um, and that helps us create that, like, navigate the heat retent or heat uh, heat qualities of a wok. Yeah, cool. Yeah, Nate, let me know how it goes. Uh, that, that This all makes sense to me in theory, uh, given that I have cooked with a cast iron wok before, or I ha used to own a cast iron wok. I've done a lot of cooking on a cast iron wok, uh, and a lot of cast iron skillet cooking, uh, but I have not actually used an induction range in, in a long time. So uh, let me know how it works out for you. Uh, ho hopefully that works. Yeah. Cool, so what I'm doing right now, so this is my beef chow fun, so I don't know if you guys can tell, uh, but it has a lot of oil, so you can tell my hands are like covered in oil. Uh, and that's because when uh, chow fun, sorry, not beef chow fun, but chow fun noodles, uh, that's because when chow fun is packaged, it's packaged in oil, uh, and that's to keep them from sticking together. Um, and if you've ever caught me caught one of these chow fun recipes before, you'll know that chow fun is one of the most frustrating ingredients that I ever work with uh, because it is stupid delicate. So uh, what I have gotten in the habit of doing is just separating each individual noodle before it gets into the wok. So we don't want to throw big chunks of noodle like this into the wok uh, because it will have uh, the tendency to clump up. So that is going to depend on how fresh your noodles are. So if they're really, really fresh, which these are, uh, these are like two, three hours old. I bought these at the market uh, at 11 o'clock, so I think they're like eight hours old. Uh, they're probably gonna be okay. Uh, but if you have relatively stale chow fun, so at least if they're, for sure, if they're like 24 hours old, uh, they're, they're gonna clump up, and then you're gonna have a big clump of chow fun uh, in your wok, which is not ever good, so. Uh, and I have done that on many streams, <laughs> many, many streams. Um, so in order to make sure that they don't clump up, uh, I've just generally gotten in the habit of uh, just separating those noodles off these first. Uh, if you do find that you're trying to separate them and they're still not coming apart, uh, if they're really, really stubborn, uh, one of my favorite tricks that I've come across is just pop it in a microwave for about a minute, uh, and then that's going to start like bringing some of those uh, noodles back together, uh, just enough so that you can start separating them, uh, which I have also done many times. Um, but stale chow fun, it's one of the biggest problems that I have ever come across. Chow fun is easily uh, one of the hardest ingredients that I have ever worked with uh, because it is stupid delicate. Yeah. Cool. Did I do everything? I think we did everything. Cool. So over on the stove, I'm heating up my wok. That's, uh, we're gonna wait for that to get ripping hot. I probably should have started it a little earlier. Uh, but once our wok is nice and hot, we can start cooking on it. Cool. 
Yeah, you love chow fun. Yeah, I love chow fun too. It's one of my favorite noodles to eat uh, because it's so like thin and delicate, uh, but stupid hard to deal with in like cooking. Uh, that and vermicelli, those are the, probably the two like most challenging noodles to work with. Uh, and I have just generally uh, gotten in the habit of any time that I buy chow fun, I'm just gonna cook all of it in like the single day. Um, so this is 16 ounces, it comes in a pack of 16 ounces. Uh, the market that I get it from also sells it in like packs of like 60 ounces of chow fun. I think they're selling it to restaurants, uh, but uh, I never buy more than 16 ounces because if you if it's more than a day old, it's probably gonna get stale. Uh, and I have like experimented with many different like ideas of like freezing them. I've tried freezing uh, chow fun, uh, which sort of works, but mostly doesn't work. So uh, just make sure that it's fresh. That's the only solution to it is just make sure that it's fresh. Um, if you are trying to source some chow fun, uh, the, the real trick is that most of the markets that you'll find them at, especially if like in Chinatown, uh, they're probably going to have to source it the day of. So that's why uh, lots of Chinese restaurants do uh, truck days like every day, uh, because a lot of the ingredients that they're using uh, is perishable within like 24 to 48 hours. So uh, chow fun being one of them, they're probably stocking that shit like every single day. There's a truck that comes in and they get a fresh batch of chow fun, uh, which means that it sells out stupid early. So the chow fun that I get from the market uh, it's gone if I get there after like two o'clock it's gone it's gonna be gone uh, and generally if I get there at like 1 30 or so I'm getting like pretty old chow fun that like it's like the last one or so uh, so if you're looking for chow fun make sure that you get to that market real early yeah cool uh, hello to everyone just tuning in. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, if this is your first time catching one of these streams, we're here every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 6.30 PST. Uh, with new recipes, those are out on the YouTube channel every Friday. So if you ever catch a Monday stream, uh, generally what we're cooking on the Monday stream is probably the recipe that came out on Friday. So uh, what we're cooking today is a Pad Ki Mao or a Thai drunken noodle, depending on like what country you're from. Um, this is a recipe that came out last uh, last Friday, so that's up on my YouTube channel right now. So, uh, if you're looking for those recipes, they all live over there. Lots of fun new content coming up. Uh, this particular recipe is part of a series that we've been doing uh, that's inspired by foods from TV and film. So this one comes from Lady and the Tramp. It's inspired by Lady and the Tramp. The Siamese cats from Lady and the Tramp. Uh, but we have a, fun, a bunch of fun new series that are coming up. Uh, there's another series that's entirely dedicated to reproducing like authentic versions of Chinese American foods, uh, things like Panda Express and PF Chang's. I'm working on a, a, a interesting or like an authentic way of approaching chow mein, uh, which is kind of hard to do because chow mein is done in so many different versions. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, just lots of other fun recipes that we've been doing. So if you're interested in stuff like that, definitely hop over to the YouTube channel and check out some of that stuff. Lots of fun new content. Uh, those are out every Friday, so if you're interested in new recipes, check that out. Uh, we're working our way to, what are we doing? Uh, 4,000 subs by the end of the month, so if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal, uh, please hop over and subscribe. Um, 4,000, pretty ambitious, we'll see. <laughs> cool. So once our wok is ripping hot, we'll be ready to go. I think this is about as hot as it's gonna get. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but generally anytime that you're cooking on a wok, uh, especially if you're cooking on a wok on a home range, uh, you're gonna wanna be cooking on high heat pretty much the entire time. So you're probably not gonna see me touch the temperature uh, of our stove today uh, at all. It's gonna be at high heat for the whole duration of time that we're cooking. And then I'm adding that's uh, four tablespoons of peanut oil. We're gonna give that a long yao, which comes from Chinese cooking. Uh, it's essentially adding cold oil to a hot wok and then coating it. Uh, and that creates our nonstick surface. Uh, and then we're starting off with our aromatics first. So this is my garlic and my ginger. Uh, and then we're gonna give that a toss until it becomes fragrant. So uh, use your nose at this point, but I usually give this about 10 seconds. Uh, but what I'm really looking for though is not actually duration of time. I'm using my nose uh, and I'm smelling. When I start smelling garlic and ginger, uh, that's generally when I know that I'm ready to move on. Next up is my ground, so this is turkey, ground turkey. Uh, and I'm breaking this up into pieces here, mostly to make sure that we don't have large clumps. Uh, but another big objective of this is to make sure that you don't let that star anise pot into your uh, wok fry, which I have done. 
uh, and if you've ever had like someone bite into the star anise pod uh, on the table, it's they don't like that. People people don't like that. So that's our ground, our ground meat, oh, that's turkey. Uh, and we're gonna let that go. That will take about two minutes or so. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is, uh, I found that pretty much anything that involves noodles, uh, but this is actually going to be a technique that you see in a lot of wok fry, uh, is a process called batch cooking, which is really, really important if you're wok cooking at home. Uh, because uh, this is like the main problem with batch cooking at home or wok cooking at home uh, is that we don't have really really high heat like you would see in restaurants um, so like the extreme heats that you need for traditional wok cooking we don't have that uh, which is not the end of the world but what we do need to do uh, is make sure that we can keep our wok as hot as humanly possible so what we do uh, in order to navigate that problem uh, is uh, remove things from the wok as the wok starts heating or filling up uh, and that just makes sure that we have a nice hot wok. Uh, so what we're gonna do here uh, is we're gonna finish cooking our meat. Uh, once that's fully cooked through, we're gonna pull it out and then cook our veggies next. And that just makes sure that when we get to our veggies, our wok is still nice and hot. our turkey I'm just pulling that out of our wok here uh, and then very important part about batch cooking is that we're gonna rinse everything out so that's uh, super super important when you batch cook uh, make sure that you give that wok a rinse in between batches if you don't take that stuff out uh, whatever that you leave behind so that's gonna be uh, some stuff that you generally want to eat actually a lot of like pork fat uh, garlic is gonna sit behind stuff like that uh, that all has to come out of the wok because if you leave it it's gonna burn and then you're gonna have like burnt flakes so you're gonna have burnt garlic and burnt fat uh, left behind in your wok so you don't want that to happen uh, kind of a bummer, probably one of the biggest downsides to batch cooking uh, is that in between each batch what you're really rinsing out is a lot of flavor. So uh, all of that bloomed aromatic stuff that's left behind, uh, any kind of fat qualities that's left behind, that's all the things that you're rinsing out, uh, which is sort of a bummer, but really, really important to make sure that it doesn't burn. Okay, yeah, you made it. Hello. Hello to everyone on YouTube. Uh, oh, am I, so, uh, so, 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 good username. I'm I trying to figure out how to pronounce some of these usernames because uh, I see a lot of the same ones all the time. Uh, am I using a wok holder? Um, so that would be, I'm assuming what you're referring to is actually a wok ring. It uh, looks like this. Um, what, what you do with a wok ring, so I'm going to turn the heat down for a second, um, is you add it to the burner like so, uh, and then you put your wok on top of it. That's uh, really, really important when you're cooking on a round bottom wok. Um, because it keeps everything in place. Uh, so mainly when you see me cooking on a wok, uh, I generally, I don't, I don't personally don't love the using wok rings um, because I feel like uh, it kind of prob ha creates problems with like moving the wok around. Uh, so you can't like shift, shift the wok as well. Um, so when I, if I'm stir frying, I generally don't use the wok ring um, because I, I just feel like I don't have as much agility as I want in the wok. Um, but definitely if I'm doing things like deep frying or like long cooking, uh, anything that has a large con amount of content in the wok. So when I do things like curry or if you see me deep frying for like a, like a honey sesame chicken or a general sauce chicken, uh, anytime that there's a large amount of liquid in the wok, uh, I'll probably, I'll use that wok ring. And that's actually why I own it is for things like that. Um, whereas like <clears throat> that's mostly really important because like I don't want to bump into the wok uh, and have it like roll off the stove, which is like super scary if you're like deep frying. Uh, uh, which is like that's probably the reason why most people don't do that in a uh, round bottom walk uh, you'll notice that like in my round bottom so it like wobbles a lot um, so if you're not careful it will absolutely just like wobble right off the stove uh, which is not good so uh, and I have done that many times at least three times <laughs> so uh, I've kind of gotten good at like making sure that doesn't happen but uh, uh, just for like safety's sake when I'm doing things like deep frying or stuff that I really don't want that thing to come off the stove I'll use that walk ring um, but yeah, I just generally find like I just can't move around as much as I want to when I have the walk ring down. 
Uh, so I usually just end up taking it off for things like this. Any, any reason why we're using turkey and not pork? Uh, mostly because I had some turkey in the freezer and it was gonna go bad, so we're using it up. Uh, but yeah, definitely like super traditionally you would use ground pork. Um, but uh, mostly I'm just trying to use up the ground turkey that was in the back of the fridge. I also find that like the fat content between turkey and pork is similar. Uh, so you can sub them out and it will generally be okay. Um, I found like if you can between using uh, ground turkey, ground pork, uh, and 80-20 beef chuck, they all have very, very similar um, fat content. So you can move around with them in, like interchangeably and it will generally still be okay. Um, I guess like hypothetically turkey is like a little bit healthier. Um, but that's not why I'm doing it. It's mostly because I had it and I'm trying to use it up. Good question though, yeah. Uh, but yeah, super often you'll see me using those three minces uh, interchangeably. I used to use ground turkey a lot more, but uh, lately I've been able to source uh, ground pork for relatively cheap, so I've been using more ground pork. You find ground pork hit and miss? Yeah, that's generally, most of the time when I use ground pork, I'll split it. So I like to use like eight, like eight ounces of, of ground pork and then eight ounces of ground turkey. Uh, and if you mix them together, sometimes they work. Um, that generally works best when I do things like bolognese and stuff. So you use like, uh, split it between like ground pork, ground turkey, and ground, uh, and maybe even the ground chicken, something like that. Uh, that will generally work as long as you're finding that fat content from somewhere, it will work out okay. But yeah, for sure it can be hit and miss, depending on what you're cooking. Okay. Cool, so our wok is nice and hot again and we're gonna do our long yao one more time. Uh, super, super important that we're gonna add our Thai chili spin. I mention this every time that we cook with Thai chilies, uh, but this is the only time that I ever turn on both of the uh, overhead, uh, overhead fans on my stove uh, is because uh, Thai chilies, because we're leaving all of those seeds in, it's gonna start kicking up a lot of um, capsaicin and uh, smoke. So that's really, really important to make sure that those extra burners are on uh, because otherwise you're gonna have a lot of smoke kicking up and you're gonna have a coughing fit. Before we do that, I actually forgot to do one thing. Uh, this is some Thai chili, so I'm gonna pull off some Thai chili leaves. Uh, this is, again, one of the more important flavors to uh, a lot of things uh, that come from Thai food. So uh, today we're gonna be using, this is gonna be about maybe a quarter cup or so. Um, and what we're really looking for are the like uh, licorice qualities that come from Thai, thai basil. Uh, so uh, lots of people ask me this, if you can uh, substitute Thai basil uh, for regular old sweet basil. Uh, they are not the same thing, so don't try and substitute those two things apart. Uh, if you can't find Thai basil, you could totally just leave it out. Uh, my favorite sub for Thai basil is usually a, a star anise pod, and that will get you that nice licorice quality. Uh, but really though, the answer is you, there's, there's no real substitute for it, you just have to find Thai basil. Uh, and that's going to be like one of those really, really iconic Thai, thai flavors. Does my smoke alarm ever go off? Yeah, um, uh, it doesn't, but that's because I unplug it every time that I, I walk cook, so. Uh, pretty much any time that you see me streaming, I'm probably unplugging those, those smoke detectors because they would for sure go off. Uh, but I also, I have a, a couple of other things that help uh, make sure that we don't set off the smoke alarms. Uh, mainly, uh, I just open all the windows. That's really, really important. Um, uh, but also I have an air purifier, which helps and is apparently a really important thing in California now because of fire season, which is not a thing that happened before. Cool, so this is our Thai basil. This is uh, about a quarter cup or so. Um, and then what we're going to do, the reason that I wanted to pick that before we headed over to the stove, which I forgot to do, uh, is because what we're going to do is we're going to add it pretty early. So I'm going to add it with our Thai chilies. Uh, and that the reason that we're going to add it so early is because it's got to hit the oil. If it doesn't hit that oil, uh, it's not going to taste like anything. So it will still look pretty because it will like be technically be in the wok, uh, but it's not going to taste like anything. You're not, not going to get those flavors out of the Thai chili or Thai basil. Um, so this is gonna be true for most aromatics, so that includes things like garlic and ginger too. Uh, so they have to get into the wok while it's empty. If it doesn't get in while it's empty, it won't contact the oil, which means that you won't have any uh, aromatic flavor. So, uh, both burners on, and here's our Thai chilies. And I'm gonna do my best not to cough. Okay. 
Next up is our Thai basil. Uh, and just like I mentioned, we're trying to bloom out some of those aromatic qualities. Uh, and I'm just making sure that it has lots and lots of contact with that oil. Then next up are, is our broccoli and bell pepper. <laughs> yeah, got me. <laughs> every time. Cool. So there's our veggies. We're going to give this a toss. Uh, and then we're going to let that go for um, maybe about a minute, maybe a minute and a half or so. Uh, we're really not trying to overcook our veggies at this point. Uh, we don't need to <laughs> cook out all of the like crisp qualities. Uh, what we're really after here is just sort of cooking up a little bit of that rawness uh, before we drop our noodles. Uh, and that's generally the quality of vegetables that you associate with wok frying, uh, where the wok, the vegetables are like, they're cooked through, so they're not raw, uh, but they're really not like all the way cooked through. They're not tender, uh, they're definitely not <laughs> uh, translucent in any way. Uh, and that's because they're flash cooked on very, very high heat for a very, very short amount of time. Uh, and you'll also notice the very last thing that we have not added is our onions. I am very intentionally holding back our onions here um, because onions are a lot more delicate than those other two elements, so our broccoli uh, and our bell pepper. Um, so I'm giving my broccoli and bell pepper a good head start, like a good solid minute, maybe even two minutes head start. Do I find the air paper help keeps the cooking smell out? Um, a little bit. It's better than not having it, uh, but the real solution to uh, getting the cooking smell out is cleaning. Uh, just uh, clean the overhead, clean the counters. Um, there's no real solution, uh, there's no real hack to not cleaning, you just gotta clean. All right, so there's our onions going in. And just like our broccoli, I'm not trying to give that a huge amount of time in the wok. Um, I'm gonna let that go for maybe a minute, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and what we're really doing is just cooking up a little bit of rawness, uh, and then we're gonna add our noodles and our uh, pork back, or turkey. Oh, what exhaust do you have? Yeah, totally. Yeah, the overhead is really, really important. It's mostly the only time that it's super important. And really the only time that I turn that second overhead on uh, is when I work with Thai chilies because it will like absolutely just like smoke up the entire house. And it's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty much what's happening right now. Yeah. So there's our veggies. That's about there. I'm not going to give it any more time than that. Uh, and there's our ground turkey going back in. Cool. Uh, and then finally, what we're going to do is add our chow fun, but I am not just going to. So what we don't want to do, so here's all of our chow fun. Uh, we very carefully do not want to add all of this at once. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and forth between our sauce and our noodles. Um, so what we're trying to do, for the same reason that we pulled the noodles apart uh, before getting to the wok, is we're trying to make sure that these don't clump up. So, uh, super, super important. The reason that we're doing this is because chow fun is really, really delicate. Uh, so we don't want to do is just add everything to the wok uh, and then toss it. So that will definitely cause things to clump up. The other thing that we definitely don't want to do uh, is just dump our sauce into the wok because that will also uh, cause things to over season if we're not being careful. So I'm adding my noodles. This is about a handful at a time. Followed by, this is maybe 
a little less than a quarter cup of sauce or so. Uh, and then I'm very, very gently now tossing uh, my noodles together. So you'll notice that I'm not doing the same kind of aggressive wok tossing anymore. Uh, that's super important once the, once the chow fun is in the wok. Uh, we're not like aggressively shaking the wok. I'm not going in, in with the metal spatula and um, shifting things around super aggressively anymore. I'm just very, very gently uh, scooping things up uh, and then very gently turning it over. So what we're trying to do here, our objective, uh, is to avoid breaking the noodles as much as possible. So uh, we don't want, what will happen if we break those noodles apart uh, is the, they're going, you're gonna get like really, really small fragmented chunks of chow fun, which is uh, still gonna be tasty, but not what we're after. We're looking uh, to keep those big, long strands of noodle here. So you'll also notice, you can probably hear this too with the new microphone, um, but all of the sizzling has suddenly stopped in my wok. So that's generally a sign if you hear that your wok is not sizzling super hard anymore. Uh, that's probably a sign that the wok is not very hot anymore. Um, in our case, that's totally fine because we're not really doing anything uh, that requires cooking anymore. But uh, if you're still doing things like sauteing veggies or uh, flash cooking meats, stuff like that, uh, and you hear that happen in your wok, it's probably a bad sign because it probably means that you're cooking on medium to medium low heat. Uh, so just like you use your nose, use your ears too. When you start hearing that happen in your wok, uh, something bad is happening. Uh, and the real solution to that is just stop what you're doing and stop moving things uh, and the wok will heat back up uh, once you stop agitating. So I mentioned this earlier on lots of streams too. This is actually true for pretty much every wok stir fry that I ever have a recipe for. Uh, is don't just go and dump all of that sauce. Stop and taste, add it, add it a little bit at a time. Uh, and stop and taste, if it needs all of it, add all of it. Uh, what I'm really doing right now is I'm judging based on color here. So I'm paying attention to the general shade of brown that our noodles are. Uh, if they get too dark, uh, then I'm gonna stop adding. I think we're right about there. Uh, and then the very last thing we're adding here is our egg. Uh, and then we're gonna give this another very gentle toss. And we're gonna give that maybe another minute to let those eggs set and then we should be good to go. What's the most important quality mark in a great pad came out? Oh yeah, good question. Um, I would say like the important mark if it's like cooked properly uh, is to make sure that those noodles are nice and long. So we have big long strands of noodles. Uh, that makes means that it was probably cooked properly. Uh, but what I really look for are all of like those like really iconic flavor notes. So things like Thai chili, uh, Thai basil, that's what. Uh, those are the things that really, really stand out to me. Uh, but in terms of technique, it's all about making sure that those noodles don't break apart. Uh, and that is definitely something that has taken me a long time to figure out how to do properly. Uh, because chow fun is so delicate. Uh, and the same is going to be true for pretty much anything that uses chow fun. So beef chow fun, um, tomato beef chow fun, uh, all of those chow fun dishes that come from Chinese food, um, pad ki mao, pad si yu, all of those things. Um, that's how it's done. It's just very, very delicately tossing. Uh, and it looks like I did end up using all of my sauce here. 
Uh, so in this case, I did actually use all of the sauce, you'll notice, but uh, I don't always do that though. So uh, kind of depending on like how much noodles we use, how many vegetables we chopped, uh, just generally based on like the volume of how much stuff is actually in the wok. Uh, sometimes I'll use all of that sauce, sometimes I won't. So uh, don't, don't just go dumping that stuff in. Uh, we want to pay attention and make sure that we don't over season there. bad about using a flat top grill oh yeah um i don't know i think i feel like that would work it just like it depends it, like it all depends on how hot you're able to get the wok if you can get the wok hot uh, and keep it hot uh, then I, it would work just fine um but it all depends on like how like what what, what the flat top is, is doing uh if you're if you're able to keep it hot like constantly at all times uh, you could probably do it on a barbecue grill even um, if as long as you can keep the wok hot and if it has like nice a nice surface area to heat on uh, you could even do it probably on a camping stove or like uh, on like a camping fire you could just have an open flame that would probably work uh, anything that keeps the wok hot at, like at a constant cool Come on. there you are All right, so last thing that we're gonna do, and this is true for any time that we cook in a wok, especially if your wok is carbon steel, like ours is here, uh, is clean the wok. You wanna clean that wok while it's hot. Don't go uh, and sit down and eat. I know that's super tempting because there's food in front of you now. Uh, but the last thing that we want to do every time that we're done cooking in our wok uh, is clean it. So while the wok is hot, we have a nice non-stick surface. Um, once it cools down, you're not going to have that non-stick surface anymore. Uh, and this is especially, especially when we're cooking with things like, things like, uh, like we are today. So you notice that some of that stuff did not even come off. I need to clean this off. Uh, because egg has a quality of like sticking, so that's what's actually happening in our wok, so we're gonna have to go through. Uh, scrape some of that off. Uh, but generally, anytime that I'm cleaning my wok, probably will mostly come off with one or two rinses. Yeah. Uh, and then the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna reheat this, uh, and that's just going to burn off anything that's kind of left behind. Then I'm giving it a good wipe down, and that will pretty much do it. Uh, and then the last thing that, I actually don't do this, but I've stopped doing this after every time that I use it, but uh, every two or three times that I use it, I'll generally add a coat of oil. I'm not actually gonna do it today uh, because uh, I did it yesterday, actually. Uh, generally, what I'll do is I try and make sure that there's a good coating of oil on our, our woks that will help keep the carbon steel from oxidizing and rusting. Uh, today, I don't think we need to because I actually did it yesterday. I see, I see, I see. Um, yeah. Nate, yeah, same thing, clean it while hot on, on a cast iron, for sure, the same thing. Yeah, on like a flat top grill, so like a, the make fried rice at a, oh, a tepanaki place. Yeah, 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 that's that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, so like, um, I think what you're refer what they're referring to, Edriva, yeah, I think what Edriva is referring to is like uh, cooking. Um, so you see this in a lot of like, um, I see it in YouTube videos all the time. Uh, and I kind of associate it with like Benihana cooking, but I actually don't think Benihana would do that. Um, but it has like a, literally a big flat top, so kind of like a, how you would see uh, like griddle griddle fryers cooking, uh, and they they do the same thing. Well, they'll, but they cook like you can they cook like everything on it. I have no idea how that's done, um, but they'll like they cook fried rice. I've seen them people doing Kobe beef on it. Uh, where they'll just throw that stuff straight onto the flat top, uh, and I guess hypothetically uh, it should all still behave the same as how a wok surface does, um, because the flat top should be hot 
like consistently hot across the board. Um, I have no context for how that's done because I have never actually tried to do that before. Uh, and as far as I know, I feel like like yeah, Teppanaki places and like like Benihana places essentially that's the only place where you generally see that done. Um, but yeah, honestly, I have I have no idea how that that how they do that. Um, but it's really interesting if you if you've ever like um, like I mostly see that on YouTube. Uh, you like uh, you'll see a lot of like really really fancy Japanese places. Uh, well, they'll do like really fancy like fried rice with like a side of like Kobe beef, but like like a one wagyu cut uh, Kobe beef, which is like 150 bucks a plate or something. Um, and they'll like cook it, cook it like really really briefly on a, a flat top. And I think like in theory, conceptually, it's doing the exact same thing so we're adding like um like very very delicate ingredients to extremely hot uh, griddle tops or flat tops uh good question though yeah i but yeah i have i have very little um point of reference for how they do that my main point of reference is the same way uh just like how those youtube videos look <laughs> yeah kobe steakhouse benihana yeah for sure Uh, but yeah, that, that's my guess though, is it would behave in the same way because the heat retention is going to be the same. Super tasty, Ooh, good amount of kick from that Thai chili. Uh, I mentioned this when I was chopping the Thai chilies up as I was chopping it, uh, but as Thai chilies get older, they they um, get a little spicier, so those Thai chilies are popping real hard, um, but still pretty tame. Uh, right around six, I feel like is a good like medium heat. Uh, if you're like averse to heat, use closer to four, three or four. Uh, if you really don't like heat, just leave them out entirely. Uh, and you can just ride the sambal alek, and sambal alek is very tame. Um, a nice bit of like crisp qualities to those veggies that are like not mushy, but like relatively crisp, but also not raw. Uh, and that uh, the ground beef or the ground pork, uh, I guess ground turkey, uh, is working really nicely. It like plays really well with the delicacy of the chow fun. So. Uh, one of my new favorite chow fun dishes right now, um, but also it just requires a lot of focus and put attention to detail because chow fun is stupid delicate. Uh, so if you've never worked with chow fun before, uh, I would totally recommend doing this dish. Uh, be, be forewarned, uh, don't watch TV while you're doing it uh, because you'll probably mess something up. I've messed it. I've messed. Uh, if you've watched one of these streams before, you'll know that I've messed up chow fun dishes more times than I've gotten right. <laughs> so like, uh, I'm at for sure like thrown out entire pounds of chow fun uh, because it's really, really perishable. It's really, really delicate. And if you don't treat it properly, it will just like, it will mold if you don't put it away properly. Um, all kinds of problems with chow fun, so. Uh, but if you nail it, it's super delicate. Um, it's like really, really tasty. Uh, very, very tender and chew. One of my favorite noodles right now. Oh yeah, you never thought about batch cooking, yeah. <laughs> Try not to throw food at my guests. Yeah, if you have a flat top, let me know how that goes. I like, I have no idea how, how those should be, because it like, the way they do it is like, literally with like a, um, like a griddle spatula. Uh, and they're just like, really, really agile with those griddle spatulas, and I don't, um, I don't know how you would like, be able to toss with that, that kind of stuff. So they like, toss the fried rice, but they do it on flat top, uh, with a, like a griddle spatula. Uh, they chop with the griddle spatula. It's all like, it's all very like, there's a lot of showmanship involved. Uh, which is why you see like Benihana doing that stuff. But I honestly, I feel like I don't think I've seen that happen at Benihana. Uh, it's mostly like Wagyu steakhouses and stuff, or Kobe steakhouses for sure, yeah. Cool, yeah. Thanks everyone. <laughs> We're at 69 scores. Cool. Uh, my name is Wesley. This is Woo Can Cook. Uh, if you haven't yet, definitely hop over to the YouTube channel and check out the stuff that's going on over there. So we've got new recipes. Those are coming out every Friday. So uh, this was a recipe that came out on the channel last Friday, so a couple of days ago. Um, we also are concurrently live streaming, so you'll notice there's a laptop that's kicking behind me. Uh, that goes to the YouTube channel. Uh, over on the YouTube channel, there's a whole bunch of fun content. That's also where the whole schedule of everything that I cook lives. Um, 
So if you were watching on YouTube, you would have known a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago, uh, that I would be cooking this because I posted it in the schedule, uh, which is a good place to look. Um, that's also where I post all of the polls for the on the community tab. So if you're looking for like uh, lots of times on Thursday, not every Thursday, but many of the Thursday streams, uh, I do a thing we call uh, "We Can Cook Whatever You Tell Me To," uh, and I do a poll of everything that's in the refrigerator, uh, and I ask for people to vote on the things uh, they want to see me put in a stir fry, uh, and then we'll assemble a recipe based off of the things that are uh, whatever you tell me to vote for. So we'll pick the top five things and we'll throw it in a recipe. Uh, super often that will work out because most of the things that are in the refrigerator will generally work out in a stir fry so things like beef and chicken carrots broccoli stuff like that uh, but really often there's things like uh, orange juice or like mozzarella cheese or like random stuff that don't belong in the stir fry uh, one time we did uh, ramen fried rice with cheese in it which actually came out pretty good um, stuff like that so uh, if you're interested hop over to the YouTube channel and check out that we're gonna be doing it in a couple weeks again so a very fun uh, experiment that we've been doing um, what else? Oh yeah, we're working our way to uh, 4,000 subs by the end of the month, so if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal. 4,000? Yeah, 4,000? Is that right? Yeah, I think 4,000 <laughs> subs by the end of the month. Uh, so if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal, please hop over and give it a subscribe. Um, yeah. Uh, that's also where we take like lots of requests too, so if you have any requests, that's a good place to be. Uh, oh cool, yeah, definitely, yeah, let me know how the fried rice goes for sure. Uh, can I make a fu- oh yeah, that's on my to-do list. All of the soup-based things uh, I'm very, very scared of because they're like uh, ramen and pho, um, udon, uh, that's a big one that I've been working on, um, neuro min that comes from Chinese food, all of the soup-based ones. Uh, they're like, those are like closely guarded family secrets that like every time that you've eaten ramen or pho or neuro min, uh, those are all things that like are family secrets that have been passed down for like generations and generations. So like <clears throat> coming onto YouTube and just being like, hey, I made this and I made something that I think is good. It's like, well, I don't know, man. It's going to be like, all right, it will be like, okay, but not like, it's not going to be amazing because like, I don't, I've never made it before, you know? Uh, so I think I can make like a pretty good pho, but I don't think it's going to even be close to like most of the restaurant pho's uh, because those guys are like, have like family secret pho and like, uh, there's a there's a place here uh, in Chinatown that makes a really really good neuro man um, that I've been going to for like 15 years because I used to go there when I was in college and I have I have no idea how to how they like perfected that it's probably like a broth that they cook uh, on the stove for like 24/7 so. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, pho, uh, pho, neuro min, ramen, udon, all, th all four of those. Those are the big four that are on my list right now. Uh, and as soon as I like work out a good broth, I'll probably take a shot at it. Yeah. Oh, you tried, you tried and left the aromatics in too long. Yeah, lots of people are afraid of that, or like they think like if you throw in the garlic and ginger first, uh, that you're worried that it's gonna burn. But uh, I actually think that's a misnomer. It's, it's totally okay to throw it in early. There, there are some cases where I don't do that. Uh, so um, but one thing that I'm thinking of is uh, spam fried rice. I don't know why I'm thinking that. I guess I just make it a lot. Um, but uh, the spam takes a little bit longer to cook than things like pork uh, or chicken. Uh, because we're trying to, to brown the exterior of the spam uh, and so what I, what happens if I throw the aromatics in and then throw the spam in uh, is that the garlic burns before the spam is browned up properly uh, so what I've started doing is throwing the spam in and then clearing some space in the wok and then adding the garlic and ginger uh, but for most things like today for example we use ground turkey uh, as long as you time the protein that comes in after it properly uh, and like as long as it integrates properly it should not burn so it should bloom properly uh, and then once it's integrated with the other things it's not going to burn because like it, as long as the other things that follow it uh, come after it properly uh, everything should become cohesive from that point onward um, but when you're working with things like uh, I don't know why I was thinking of spam I think it's just because I make it a lot um, when you're working with stuff like that where it's not going to actually integrate because the spam is in chunks uh, it will absolutely burn if you're not careful so uh, if you're really worried about it just hold back on it uh, and then when you do add your aromatics whenever that might be uh, just push everything to one side in the wok so uh, I don't have anything to walk anymore. Uh, but just push everything to one side, and you see this in street cooking a lot. Uh, you push everything to one side, add a little bit more oil, and then add the garlic and ginger to that oil. Uh, and as long as it's making contact with that oil, it will bl bloom out the aromatic qualities. 
Um, but if it doesn't hit the if it doesn't hit the oil in the wok, it's not going to taste like anything. It doesn't matter how much garlic and ginger you use; it just won't taste like anything. Um, oh, you usually throw it in the middle. Yeah, totally cool. Yeah, if you use, if you throw it in the middle, that's what I would recommend: is try uh, um, pushing things to one side and then throwing it in. Um, you could throw it in the middle as long as it hits the oil; it will be okay. Uh, the main reason why I recommend throwing it in, throwing it in first is to make sure that it makes contact with that oil. Oh, you never thought about batch cooking with wok? Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's probably like a big, a really, really important part about wok cooking. Uh, if you're not cooking in a restaurant on like a restaurant burner, uh, it's super, super important. So if you've ever had like uh, wok fries, so stir fries or like uh, like a vegetable stir fry or something uh, where it's like kind of got that porridge consistency where it's almost like it's not quite oatmeal, but it's basically the consistency of oatmeal where it's like mushy uh, and like very very overcooked or like soupy a little bit uh, that's happening because the wok is not hot enough so you're not able to keep uh, the high heat qualities of the wok uh, for the entire duration of the time so things will happen where like uh, the first thing that you throw in for example if you like cook your veggies first uh, the veggies will be crispy uh, but the next thing that you throw in so like uh, your protein so your chicken or your ground beef or whatever uh, that won't be crispy or that won't be like flash cooked properly because it was cooked on medium to medium low heat uh, which is how you end up with mushy stir fries so Cool, yeah. Oh yeah, thanks Nate. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name is Wesley, this is Wu Can Cook. If you haven't checked it out, hop over to the YouTube channel too. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow cooking something. I forget what we're cooking. I want to say it's uh, Dajamian, I think. I forget. Uh, but yeah, definitely hop over to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet. Those new recipes are coming out every Friday. Uh, so this Friday coming up is egg rolls, I think. We're doing Chinese egg rolls and lumpia uh, coming up this Friday. Uh, and then after that, I believe, is chicken uh, katsudon. Uh, katsudon buri, which comes from, it's like a Japanese cutlet uh, rice bowl. Uh, Last week we did uh, pad kimao, but before that I completely forget. Oh, I think we did steamed eggs, that was the week before, so. Uh, lots of new recipes, those are out every Friday, so we're working our way to 4,000 subs by the end of the month. Uh, so if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal, please go over and subscribe. Cool, thanks everyone, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Yeah.
With the shape of you. One weekend we let the story begin We're going out on our first date yeah. You and me are 50 So go all you can eat Fill up your bag and I fill up a plate We talk for hours and hours About the sweet and the sour And how your family is doing okay yeah. We'll even get in a taxi We'll kiss in the backseat Tell the driver make the radio play Now I'm singing like Girl you know I want your love Your love was handmade For somebody like me Come on now follow my lead I may be crazy Grab on my waist and put that body on me Come on now, follow my lead Come, come on now, follow my lead I'm in love with the shape of you We push and pull like a magnet do Although my heart is falling too I'm in love with your body and Last night you were in my room And now my bed sheets smell like you Every day discovering something brand new I'm in love with your body Baby, come on. Come on, be my 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 baby,